it's time for us to check back in with Dory, Woman of the Mountains, and see what happens next. If you've missed any of the previous readings, please look in the description below for a playlist. We're picking back up where in the last part that we read, we had just been introduced to Fred, Dory's future husband. So this is still talking about Fred. His years had been spent in the wilderness and a cotton mill didn't figure in his plans. He looked toward the mountains and planned his escape from the domination of his father and the imprisonment of the mills. He secretly packed his clothing in a paper bag, slipped out the back bedroom window and made his way back to Elkmont. He hitched a few short rides, but mostly he walked. He would let his family know where he was later. He went to Letha McMahon's to board. The first time I ever saw him, he was walking up the railroad tracks in front of our house on his way to work as a fireman for the railroad. It soon became evident that Letha was smitten with him. She stayed home more and we took fewer and fewer walks together. He was still in my best and only friend and I didn't like it. One lonely Sunday afternoon, I walked over to her house. They were sitting on the front porch. Letha was on the top step with him behind her. Her long hair was flowing down her back and he was combing it. We always wore our hair in braids and I'd never seen hers undone. I walked up and stood beside the steps, not saying anything. Hello, he said. Do you want me to comb your hair too? They both laughed. My face felt hot and stinging from embarrassment and rage. You're a son of sh I snapped and walked away. After I got to the railroad, I started running home, my black braids flying behind me. Tears filled my eyes. I'd never said anything like that before. Ma and Pa would use a switch on me if they even suspected I knew such words. I was surprised at myself for the feelings I'd had. I hoped desperately I'd never see him again, but I did. He walked past our house twice a day going to and from work. He was so sure of himself. Even his walk and the lock of black hair falling on his forehead suggested conceit. I thought he was hateful, spiteful, and worst of all, he knew my guilty secret. Nice girls didn't say things like that, and it haunted me. I had a feeling he was laughing at me. Dreading to see Letha again, I worked extra hard for Ma and stayed inside. Letha liked Fred, and I thought she might marry him. I didn't make friends easily, and I'd lost the best one I ever had. One of Ma's young boarders liked me, but I was too shy to say anything to him. He was nice and handsome, but I spent more time disliking Fred Cope than liking Richard Bowles. My horror knew no bounds when one Friday afternoon, Pa brought home a new boarder, Fred Cope. He told Pa he wanted to stay with us because Ma was said to be the best cook in camp. Pa had no idea I knew this young man. I felt trapped in a web of my own making. He'd be living in the same house with me and I'd be serving him meals. He complimented Ma on being known as a good cook. He smiled pleasantly and gave no indication he had ever seen me before. Fred wrote his family that he had returned to the mountains and had a good job. Shortly after, they moved to the Greenbrier section to work for Champion Lumber Company. Mr. Cope started a singing school soon after moving. Money, of course, was part of the reason, but the Copes loved to sing. Along with conventional music, he taught old harp singing. Old harp singing was a mountain tradition. Using books brought from England, Scotland, and Ireland generations ago, they sang the notes of old familiar hymns. In old harp, each note is represented by a different shape note. Instead of singing the words, musical notes are sung, he and his daughter sang in churches or wherever they could. When Fred went home on the weekends, he sang with them. The fact that he could sing Old Harp helped his image with Ma somewhat. She loved to sing and went to the Old Harp gatherings when she could manage. I felt lonely and hated to admit I cared that he was gone. Weeks passed before he said anything to me. Never at a loss for words, he had charmed all the people at our house except Ma. She thought he was a braggart and a little too feisty, even if he could almost best her at singing. Spring came, bringing warm winds and sunshine. 
Stubborn patches of snow gave way to a forest floor covered with wildflowers. The trees were covered with tiny yellow-green leaves. Spring in the mountains is always a time of new beginnings, almost like resurrection. Things that seemed dead and useless suddenly burst with life. Nobody stayed inside when the warm sunlight touched them. People idly walked the railroad tracks on Sunday and wandered into the forest to pick wildflowers. Friendly waves and smiles were exchanged. Fred started asking me to take Sunday walks with him. It wasn't long before people knew we were talking to each other. When young folk in the mountains talked to each other, it meant they were keeping steady company. There wasn't any entertainment or any place to go. We spent most of our time under the watchful eyes of Ma, Pa, and seven boarders. The men teased us unmercifully and smiled knowing smiles when we walked out the door. Fred liked to fish. Sometimes we'd sit on the banks of the river while he tried his fishing skills. The water was so clear that every rock in the bottom was visible. The speckled sides of the trout caught the sunlight through the water. They swam close to the bottom and around the smooth rocks. The jewels on their sides sparkled. Speckled and rainbow trout are not easily caught, but Fred usually got his share. He tried to teach me to fish, but I hated it. I couldn't bear to take the hook out of the fish's mouth. It had to be a very painful thing for the poor trout. The only fish I ever caught was a brown trout that was about eight inches long. When it took my line, it startled me. I jerked the pole so hard the fish went sailing over my head and crashed into the trunk of a big oak tree. The fish was dead by the time I got to it. Fred told me it wouldn't hurt to take the hook out now. We walked through the woods while he told me about gathering wild herbs to sell. Ginseng and spikenard were sold to collectors who sent them to China. The Chinese thought these herbs were the elixir of life and used them for all physical and mental diseases. The demand in China for ginseng was so great that large quantities were sent from our mountains to the Chinese mainland. Galax leaves were sold to florists for use in floral arrangements. These dark green glossy leaves were beautiful. Neither Ma nor Pa had ever been interested in herbing, so we never looked for any other than for our own use. Ma used sassafras tea and asafetida for colds. Asafetida was put into a small bag and hung around the neck to prevent colds. The strong pungent odor would clear your head in minutes. My cousin smoked rabbit tobacco, a green gray plant that grew around the barn. I doubt there is a farm boy who didn't sneak out behind the barn to puff rabbit tobacco a long time before he was old enough to try the real thing. More herbing was done on the North Carolina side than in Tennessee. People in the high mountains wouldn't have had any way of selling herbs because of the isolation. Peddlers with all kinds of merchandise rode the train into the lumber camps. Redfoot, the jewelry man, came every four months or so to sell trinkets to the boys who had become smitten with the girls in camp. He did a lot of business. For the first time in their lives, people had a little money they could use to buy frills and frivolous things. Our Jewish peddler brought beautiful embroidered linens to show the ladies. Ma bought a tablecloth and a dresser scarf. Fred bought a little gold locket for my 16th birthday. I was so happy, I shyly kissed him on the cheek. I have something else for you, he said, but you'll have to marry me to get it. He handed me a tiny box. Inside was a ruby ring with a small pearl on each side. It was beautiful. Try it on and see how you like it. I slipped it on my finger and felt like a fairy princess. My joy was short-lived, though. I knew Pa and Ma wouldn't let me marry him. I was too young, and besides, Ma wasn't happy with the prospect of having him for a son-in-law. I begged, pleaded, and cried until she gave her permission. Dory, I was 23 when I got married, seven years older than you are now, and I had a hard time taking on all the responsibilities. You'll be sorry, she said. You'll be sorry. Fred hadn't told his family about me. I'm sure they wouldn't have let him marry me if they had known. He knew it too, and that's why he didn't say a word. Mr. Cope thought they were better than the Mountaineers. It was all right to work among them, but marry them? Never. They were ancestor conscious, and we had no records to prove our lineage. 
It wasn't easy to keep in touch with your family and maintain close ties over the years when it was so hard to get from one hollow to the next. Mostly our lineage came down to us by word of mouth, not written records. Besides, Ma always said, it's who you are now that counts, not who your grand great-grandfather was. So facing disapproval from my family and possible rage from his, we made plans to be married at the end of May. Ma made me a new navy dress for the wedding. The soft sheer linen was called lawn. Ma said she'd always heard lawn was named for the city in France where it was first made. All our nice summer dresses were made from it. We picked out a dress in the Montgomery Ward catalog and copied it. No more little girl dresses with a high collarless neckline for me. This dress would have long puffy sleeves, a V-neck with lace collars and buttons to the waist. Six tucks at the waist drew the dress close to my body, showing off a small waistline which had been hidden under the straight little girl dresses. Fred got the license and said the sooner the better for him. There were no ministers nearer than Gatlinburg. We would have to go there for the ceremony. Pa and Ma couldn't come with us because of the borders. They wouldn't have transportation after they got off the train in Elkmaw anyway. Ma, less than enthusiastic about the whole thing, left it to us to find a way. We finally decided that I would go to Boogertown on Friday and wait for Fred to come Sunday. We would find a minister at one of the churches in Oldham's Creek, Glades, or Gatlinburg. So it was decided I would go home with the Uncle Dave Watson to Oldham's Creek. Uncle Dave worked for the Little River Lumber Company, staying on the job during the week, but going home over weekends. We hadn't told him I was going to be married. He thought I wanted to visit his family. Uncle Dave was always sweet and kind. I liked him very much and felt somewhat guilty for us using him this way. On Friday, Ma packed my clothes in a basket, the same one I had taken to Miss Maddie's house, my wedding dress and the new cream-colored straw hat that Ma had bought at the company store were put in last so they wouldn't get wrinkled and mashed. Uncle Dave came by for me after work. I wanted to stay home until Fred got there, but Uncle Dave was anxious to get started. We rode the train to Elkmont and walked the rest of the way home. I walked along beside him, swinging my basket with my long braids bouncing on my back. We went through Fighting Creek, Gatlinburg, Dudley, the Glades, and finally Oldham's Creek came into view. I wasn't tired. My feet seemed to have wings that carried me along the familiar paths. Aunt Rentha and Dicey were happy to see me. Everything looked the same as it did the first time I came into this place of rounded hills. The orchard had already bloomed. A few late blossoms nodded to me as I walked through the trees, remembering summers past. Twice now, Uncle Dave had brought me into this hollow. The first time, we were poverty-stricken and weary, coming from the cotton mills in South Carolina. This time, the world was mine. Ma and Pa were making good money with the borders and Pa's railroad work, and I was ready to start a home of my own. Time, indeed, changes all things. My cousin and I sat for hours talking about things that had happened to us since our last meeting. She had a beau whom she was thinking of marrying. I told her Fred was very special to me, but I didn't tell her I was going to marry him on Sunday. Somehow I couldn't tell her my secret. There was no reason not to tell her. Maybe I thought they'd try to talk me out of marrying so young. Early Sunday morning, Fred stood at the front door. He had bought a new suit and a hat for our wedding. The suit had narrow lapels and the pant legs were straight around his ankles. Pegged, I think they were called. The hat sat firmly in the middle of his forehead, halfway between his eyes and hairline. He looked so serious and maybe a little bit scared. Aunt Retha thought Ma had sent him to bring me home. He waited outside while I dressed and put my hair up in a bun on the back of my head. It wouldn't look right to be married in schoolgirl braids. My hat was held on with two of Ma's hat pins. I picked up my basket of clothes and told everyone goodbye. They'd be surprised when they heard about my wedding. Fred had borrowed a buggy and two beautiful black horses. To this day, I don't know whom they belong to. It never occurred to me to ask. I had other things to think about. We were going to Gatlinburg to find a preacher. 
The day was beautiful. The horses kept a steady pace. A warm breeze tugged at my dress, which reached to my ankles just above the tops of my new patent leather slippers. I'd never been happier or felt more grown up or pretty. On the river road in the middle of Gatlinburg, we met Reverend Pinckney Ormby coming towards us on a horse. He was on his way to preach in the Oldham's Creek Church. Fred stopped him and told him we wanted to get married. Reverend Ormby wanted to marry us right on the spot. Fred and I looked at each other. This wasn't exactly what we'd planned. We had hoped to be married in a church or the preacher's home. Why not, Fred said with a smile. Reverend Ormby sat tall and dignified in the saddle. He reached into his saddlebag, took out his Bible, and began. We sat where we were and joined hands. A cathedral couldn't have been more beautiful than the setting for our marriage. We sat in a shiny black buggy pulled by two sleek black horses. The clear blue of the sky, the soft green and purple hues of the mountains, and the profusion of wildflowers made a perfect picture. Birds sang in the trees, and the crystal stream made a soft rushing noise. The strong, fast beat of my heart crowded into my ears, blocking out the words that would change my life. Do you, Dory, take this man till death us do part? I pronounce you man and wife. Amen. I never heard the rest of the ceremony. The timidly spoken I do's were carried away in the breeze and the Russian River. Reverend Ormby must have heard them because he said, That will be a dollar, please. Fred paid him and shook his hand. He turned on his horse and galloped away towards Oldham Creek, already late for his service. We started back to camp. There was no place else for us to stay. Only rich people from Knoxville stayed at the Mountain View Hotel in Gatlinburg. It was almost the middle of the day, and neither of us had thought about what we would eat for lunch. Bohannon's store was closed, it being Sunday. We'd have to go back to fish camp before we could eat. Everything was quiet at the boarding house. The men didn't say much to us. I had expected a lot of teasing from everyone, but supper was eaten in unusual silence. After eating, they disappeared one by one. I helped Ma with the dishes and then sat outside with Fred until bedtime. The boarders were still gone, but nobody seemed to notice except me. As soon as we went to bed, the house was surrounded with men and women. The door flew open and the room was filled with people. Faces filled the space above our bed, some familiar and some strangers. They lifted Fred as easily as a child and carried him outside, nightshirt and all. Four men had a rail on their shoulders. Fred was put astride of the rail and carried around the camp with much hooting and laughing echoing from the hilltops. After Fred was gone, the women tried to get me up, but I wrapped myself completely in the bed covers and pleaded to be left alone. They must have felt sorry for me because their attention was soon diverted to helping Ma with the refreshments. Stack cake, pies, and coffee were ready when they brought Fred back about 30 minutes later. Ma had helped plan the chivalry. It seemed hours before the last person left and Ma's boarders finally went to bed. I felt strange being in the adult world of weddings and chivalries. Earlier in the day, I had been a 16-year-old pigtailed child without a care in the world. When I awoke the next morning, the years stretching ahead of me would be years of homemaking, childbearing, and growing up myself. Fred wrote his family that we were married. They answered that they were coming to Ma's the next weekend to meet me and my family. Fred and I had the feeling things were going to be somewhat strained. On Sunday afternoon, the whole family of in-laws came. Fred's father had a deep, resounding voice that sounded like thunder in the mountains. Ma was already on edge because she sensed their apprehension. I felt small and shy. My tongue seemed to stick to the roof of my mouth, and I couldn't say anything. Our two families had nothing in common. The only thing they found right with my family was our politics. They were Methodists. We were Baptists. Mr. Cope was educated. My father could barely write his name. After what seemed forever, they left. Ma and Mr. Cope were equal in their feelings for each other. One was the match for the other in verbal combat. When they were out of sight, Ma, with her blue eyes blazing and her face flushed rosy red, said, I got the feeling they didn't think our little heifer was good enough for their little bull. Ma never cursed, but she had a definite way with words. We stayed with Pa and Ma two weeks and then moved into the cabin where my friends, Martha and Letha, had lived. 
Fred and Muncy were good friends, and at last, Muncy could come in the house and not have to watch for the broom to come down across his back from nowhere. He slept on the foot of our bed. Ma gave me enough quilts and bed linens to start housekeeping. We bought a set of plain white dishes at the company store. A black cast iron skillet and a Dutch oven were the only good cooking utensils I had. The battered coffee pot and the forks, knives, and spoons had been borrowed from the boarding house. I didn't know how to cook anyway. Ma never had the time or the patience to teach me. It was easier for her to do it herself, and she didn't want me poking about in her kitchen. After my miserable failures, Fred brought home a cookbook. It was called The White House Cookbook. All of the first lady's pictures were in it and their favorite recipes for serving foreign dignitaries when they came to Washington. Most of the recipes needed things I'd never heard of and couldn't possibly find in the company store. Fred thought we were losing a grand chance to make some money because we had an extra bunk in the other end of the cabin, which could have been used by a boarder. He brought a parting man home from Gatlinburg to stay with us. It had been bad enough trying to cook for Fred. Now I had a stranger in the house. He stayed a few weeks until my patience ran out. People were begging for places to stay, but I didn't want anybody in my house for any amount of money. Most people who grew up in the mountains never thought they had a right to privacy. It was a rare cabin that had two rooms. Everybody lived together in one room, sharing all activities and illnesses. I couldn't do all that was expected of me as a married woman. Maybe Ma had been right about me marrying so young. I was still 16, and a part of me wanted to play and be free. More than anything, I wanted to be alone to make mistakes cooking, to read a book in silence, and to show affection for my husband without being seen. There would always be more men than lodging places anyway. Our one bunk could stay empty while I learned to make the change from child to woman. Fred kept in touch with his parents. They were planning to move back to North Carolina to work in the cotton mills in Gaston County. Before they moved, they wanted to stay a few days with us and try to get us to move with them. Panic swept over me. I hadn't seen them since their Sunday visit to Ma soon after we were married. I wanted to make a good impression on them. For days, I searched through my cookbook to find just the right things to cook. Chicken, ham, vegetables, and cornbread would do fine. For my most spectacular achievement, I was going to bake a cake with chocolate icing. Fred took me to the store to get all the cake ingredients. Ma gave us chicken and ham. Fred killed the chicken, but I plucked it. Ma laughed at me because I still couldn't wring the poor chicken's neck or chop off its head. She'll never learn, Ma said. She was right. I'd never learn because I didn't want to learn. My mother-in-law was surprised and pleased with my efforts as a cook. She had never seen a cake with chocolate icing before. Most people didn't put icing on their cakes. The cakes were usually stack cakes or layer cakes sprinkled with spices and sugar. There wasn't a crumb of my cake left. Fred was proud of me. He smiled and bragged to his family about the good little cook he had. We resisted all their pleas to go with him to North Carolina. The weekend was pleasant, and I felt maybe things would be fine between us since Ma and Mr. Cope would have miles and mountains keeping them apart. Our boarder, Mr. Parton, was gone. The Cope family had moved to North Carolina, and I had nobody to look after except Fred, Muncy, and myself. After he went to work and I had cleaned the cabin, I had nothing to do except indulge myself. I read everything I could get my hands on. The lazy summer days were blissful. Sometimes I'd go visit with Ma, but she never had much time for chatter. I was a true lady of leisure for the first time. Fred was getting good wages on his job and we didn't have a place for a garden. All this meant I could be as lazy as I wanted to be without feeling guilty. Things had changed for the mountain women. The lumber companies had brought the outside world to us. The men made the money, and the company brought in goods to spend the money on. I would never have to work like Ma did when she was young. Another enjoyable peek into Dory's life. Um, I have so many parts. I love the whole book, so I'm always going to have favorite parts, everything that I read to you. 
but I love the when her and Fred first met, how she couldn't stand him at first, but then she fell madly in love with him. Uh, and all that part, um, even the spring, how they got married in the spring, and all the beautiful flowers and the, the warm temperatures and the blue skies and all those wonderful things really hit home to me because, of course, my daughter, Corey, is about to get married. So, um, it, so many similarities there made me, of course, Corey's not going to elope. She's going to have a, have a wedding and she's much older than Dory and all those, of course, a different time frame and all that. But those kind of, all those little tidbits of their, their running off to get married really, really jumped out at me because we're going through the same thing and it is almost spring of the year. I found it interesting that Fred's family was musical, that they could sing, that shape note singing. If you've never heard shape note singing, it's really beautiful. Um, and there's very, there's several different kind of varieties of it or different types of it, I would say. But if you search, you can find some of the, some on uh, YouTube for sure, and you can hear, hear what it sounds like. It's really beautiful. And it's really hard to do is what I found. Corey and Katie and I one time went to a a two-week gospel music sing singing school and most of it was about other types of singing I mean just you know just learning songs together and uh, pitch and those kind of things but but there was one part of it that was shape note singing and the folks that could really do it good that had been doing it a long time it was just amazing to hear them all in that beautiful harmony sing those shape notes and I remember we did one song like for our culmination concert we did a lot of songs but in one of them, we switched back and forth between the lyrics, like do a verse of the lyrics and then a verse of the shape notes and then a verse of the lyrics. And it was really just really beautiful. Another part that I really liked that goes back to the wedding is that chivalry. A chivalry is a tradition in days gone by in Appalachia where when, when a couple got married, they typically didn't go on a honeymoon. They just went back home and their friends and their neighbors would get together and they would go, you know, secretly sneak up on them at the house and they would beat on pots and pans and, and the, they, would, they would get the husband and carry him out and carry him around the house on a rail or on their shoulders or in a wagon and they would tease the wife and then after that they would all have refreshments and often they would bring gifts so that was kind of like the shower um, and so we say that they snuck up on them but really they expected it they knew it was coming I'm sure maybe Dory thought they would they wouldn't do it to her since she was at her mother's house <laughs> but I'm sure that in most cases people expected it was going to happen now that's not a tradition that happens uh, not happening in in this day and time like for Corey and Austin I don't think no one's going to do that if they have or if they are planning it they've certainly not let me in on the game so um but it's interesting that that was one of the wedding traditions from days gone by. One other part that I really enjoyed was the part about Dory not being able to cook. It reminded me of Granny. When she first got married, she said before, right before they were married, she told uh, Daddy, told Pap, said, Jerry, now I have to tell you I can't cook. Mother never taught me to cook. So in the same way that Dory's mother didn't teach her to cook, um, so I like that part and that Fred bought her a cookbook and she tried to cook out of it and then how proud he was when she cooked such a fine meal for his parents you know when they come to visit and especially the chocolate cake that they were so impressed I would love to have had a piece of Dory's chocolate cake wouldn't you so I hope that you'll leave a comment and tell me what you liked about this part of the book and as always I hope you'll drop back by next Friday because we've got to see what happens next to Dory woman of the mountains